be reading text 39, Canto 3, chapter 24. Mam Atmanam Svayam Jyoti Sarva Bhuta Gaha Guha Shayam Atman Yevatmana Viksha Vishoko Bhayam Richasi Mam Atmanam Svayam Jyoti Sarva Bhuta Gohashayam Atman Yevatmana Viksha Vishoko Bhayam Richasi The Supreme Soul, or Paramatma, Svayam Jyoti, Self-Effulgent, Sarva Bhuta, of all beings, Guha, in the hearts, Ashayam, dwelling, Atmani, in your own heart, Eva, indeed, Atmana, through your intellect, Viksha, always seeing, always thinking, Vishokaha, free from lamentation, Abhayam, fearlessness, Richasi, you will achieve. Translation. So this is Kapila Dev speaking to Kardama when he was given permission yesterday for Kardama to go to the forest and continue his life of um, meditation upon Kapila. In your own heart, through your intellect, you will always see me, the supreme self-effulgent soul, dwelling within the hearts of all living entities. Thus you will achieve the state of eternal life, free from all lamentation and fear. Report. People are very anxious to understand the absolute truth in various ways, especially by experiencing the Brahma Jyoti or Brahma effulgence by meditation and by mental speculation. But Kapila Dev uses the word mam, 
to emphasize that the personality of Godhead is the ultimate feature of the absolute truth. In Bhagavad Gita, the personality of Godhead always says, Mom, unto me. But the rascals misinterpret the clear meaning. Mom is the supreme personality of Godhead. If one can see the supreme personality of Godhead as he appears in different incarnations and understand that he has not assumed a material body but is present in his own eternal spiritual form, then one can understand the nature of the personality of Godhead. Since the less intelligent cannot understand this point, it is stressed everywhere again and again simply by seeing the form of the Lord as he presents himself by his own internal potency as Krishna or Rama or Kapila. One can directly see the Brahma Jyoti because the Brahma Jyoti is no more than the effulgence of his bodily luster. Since the sun shine is the luster of the sun planet, by seeing the sun, one automatically sees the sunshine. Similarly, by seeing the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one simultaneously sees and experiences the Paramatma feature as well as the impersonal Brahman feature of the Supreme. Paragraph. The Bhagavatam has already enunciated the that the absolute truth is present in three features. In the beginning, as the impersonal Brahman, in the next stage as the Paramatma in everyone's heart, and at last, as the ultimate realization of the absolute truth, Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One who sees the Supreme Person can automatically realize the other features, namely the Paramatma and Brahman features of the Lord. The words used here are Vishoko, Bhayam, Vichasi. Simply by seeing the personality of Godhead, one realizes everything. And the result is that one becomes situated on the platform where there's no lamentation and no fear. This can be attained simply by devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Hmm. Oh, the verse again. In your own heart, through your intellect, you will always see me, the Supreme, self-effulgent soul, dwelling within the hearts of all living entities. Thus, you will achieve the state of eternal life free from all lamentation and fear. The verses, one of the key verses referenced in the purport is something that's found in Canto 1, Chapter 2, a very important verse. There's um, in that Canto 1, Chapter 2, there's two verses that are pointed to by our Acharyas as being particularly important for the entire Bhagavatam. This one referenced as one of them. The, the primary one is the one that states that Krishna is, Swayam Bhagavan Krishna is the fountainhead or source of everything. Everything comes from him. Same as he states in Bhagavad Gita. Every, I'm the source of everything, everything comes from me. He's the, so that's, that's the, by definition, that's the absolute truth. Vedanta Sutra is searching for that from which everything comes. So in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna declares, I am that from which everything comes. 
and the Bhagavatam declares Swayam Bhagavan Krishna is that from which everything comes. Searching for the absolute truth has a purpose. We take shelter there. That's our, our human mission is to discover that which is the source of everything and connect with that which is the, that's the meaning of yoga to connect with that which is the source of everything. Then there's this other that's called Paribhasya Sutra, technically, that's a technical term, that has a, a, a Vedic definition of what it is. And it's one verse generally found at the beginning of a text or early in the text that expresses the essence of the entire text and it is like the emperor that rules many kings. There may be other kingly or very important statements in a text. They must be understood to be in alignment with that principal one, the emperor, Paribhasya Sutra. Then there's another technical term called Mahavakya. Mahavakya means principal utterance, maha, vakya, vak means speech. So that's this other one that's referenced, and I'll say it slowly, the verse. <clears throat> Vedanta tat, tatva vidvas, tatvam yajjanam advayam, advayam, the non-dual nature of the absolute truth, by those who are learned Vedantists, Vedanta vid, they know the Vedanta. So what's that non-dual substance that learned persons that know Vedanta say? Brahmeti, Paramatmeti, Bhagavaniti, Shabhyate. Very short, very packed up little verse <coughs> that says, again, those who are realized knowers of the truth, they understand that the absolute, the non-dual reality of existence has three features, Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagavan. Interesting. They're all non-dual. Bhagavan is non-dual. He, he is of the absolute nature. He is absolute. There's no duality in him. As Prabhupada is pointing out in the purport, it's a mistake <clears throat> some commentators make to say that when Krishna appears, it's, there's an inside Krishna and the outside Krishna. There's no inside out, like we have an inside outside. We have a body and we have a soul. So the soul is the inside and the body is the outside. And we're not the body, we're the soul. That's, for us, there's a distinction between the body and self. For Krishna, there is no distinction. There is no distinction. Mudho yam nabi janati. The persons who are foolish, um, they think manushim tanam ashratam. They think I've accepted a material body like they have. I'm like one of them, but I'm not one of them, those foolish people, because my body and myself are the same. So the, again, this Bhagavan feature is non-dual. The form and the person, the entity that has the form, there's no difference. That's the nature of the absolute realm. And this Bhagavan feature has another aspect, and that's the Paramatma feature, and then that has another as the same absolute truth as the Brahman feature. So what Prabhupada is explaining, he keeps it really simple. The Brahman, or the Brahma Jyoti, that's the effulgence of the Lord's spiritual form, commonly like in paintings. There's an effulgence around part of Krishna's body, generally like saintly people, they show effulgence around their head, or the upper part of the upper torso, effulgence. So that light 
is connected to the self. So there's no disconnect. Krishna has effulgence. Wherever there's Krishna, there's effulgence. Wherever there's effulgence, there's Krishna. They're inseparable. So the jyoti, the Brahma jyoti, is an aspect of that same absolute truth. And then comes the Paramatma feature, which is being described in the, to some extent, is being described in the purport, or the verse, situated in the heart of every living entity as Bhagavan expanded. And Bhagavan expands everywhere in that feature, the Paramatma feature. Um, something that I learned from Radhika Raman, a devotee that did his PhD at Oxford University in three verses of Jiva Goswami's Sandarbhas and Paramatma Sandarbha specifically. And he describes the Paramatma feature in interesting language. It's a compressed or suppressed exhibition of the Supreme Lord. That is to say, Bhagavan has 64 qualities Paramatma has four less of those 64. He has 60 qualities. And he has a specific function on behalf of Bhagavan. He's expanded to oversee the affairs of the material energy. He doesn't become contaminated by them, but he deals with creation, maintenance, and dissolution. That's the Paramatma feature, the Vishnu feature. So that Vishnu feature and the Brahma Jyoti feature and the Bhagavan, Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam feature, they're all of the same absolute nature. There's not duality within them. So now how does that fit into what the verse is saying and the purport is saying? It connects to the word mom. Mom is a, a personal pronoun, me, unto me, not just me, but unto me, possessive pronoun, think of me, or be, be, man, mana, bhava, mad, bhakto, madhyaji, mam, namaskuru, it's, it's, it's personal, so, it's a, but it's a pronoun, and there are followers of the Vedas, particularly there's the Gyanis, those that like the Upanishads, that speak of that same absolute in a pronoun as tat. That, that pronoun, that refers to whatever that is, whatever the source of everything is, that's the absolute truth, so it's tat. So they interpret because they're Gyanis, they interpret that Tat means impersonal Brahman. And if you take that position, then what happens to Paramatma and Bhagavan? They disappear. Philosophical magic. It's like the rabbit in the hat. See the hat? There's no rabbit and then they stick their hand in and pull the rabbit out and then they put the rabbit back in the head and the rabbit's gone. <clears throat> they say, the Ganis that study the Upanishads say that word tat refers to Brahman and all there is is Brahman and anything else is not Brahman. Anything else is anything, anywhere there's the appearance of more than one thing, that's Maya. So the, the form of Krishna's body is Maya. This idea that there's a Paramatma feature, that's Maya. And they just whitewash the whole, um, these series of distinctions that Prabhupada says, it's in the Vedas again and again and again and again and again and again and again, because there's a tendency to go that other way, that go that other way is a philosophical, basically word jugglery that says, I'm the Supreme. And here's our, our uh, 
scriptural references and our interpretation of these scriptural references that justifies that position, we're the supreme. Aham, Brahmasmi being one of them. I am the supreme. See, I'm the supreme. There it says, Aham Brahmasmi. Dismissing all the rest of what the Vedas are also saying. Just that's taken as the principal utterance and therefore other messages are to be interpreted through that lens. I am supreme. I am the absolute. You and me and every one of us were God. That's the notion that such uh, spiritual view holds. And the emphasis is being presented here. There's many, but the emphasis here is this mom is first person singular. It's not a mistake. It's intentional. Kapila Dave is speaking first person singular. Saying that I am within the heart. And then he then he adds that one can see him in his spiritual form as he is present in in his paramatma future within the heart of every living entity. He's everywhere. Exactly as Prahlad said to his father, Randikashipu, where is Vishnu? He's everywhere. Not figuratively. The form of Vishnu, the Paramatma feature, is within every atom and within the heart of every living entity, like the discussion yesterday evening. Within our body, there's the soul. But there's not just one entity within this body. There's all kinds of microbes and microorganisms and germs and what have you. And there, there are also souls there. And each soul has side by side within the soul, Paramatma. He's, he's everywhere, literally. He's not just within the soul, he's within every atom. He, literally everywhere. In that sense, all pervasive. But that's an expansion, a kala, in the Sanskrit language, or a portion of a plenary portion, there's a technical reason why that language is used, of Bhagavan, and he's, he's, so we can say Krishna is in the heart of every living entity, which is true in his Vishnu form, in his Paramatma form. So he's giving this benediction, Kapila is giving a benediction to his pure devotee, Kardama. When you go to the forest and engage in your meditation, you will see me. in your heart always. And it's, it's worth noting, in the Sanskrit word for word, um, viksha, atmani, evatmana, viksha. Viksha is translated word for word as always seeing, as well as always thinking. Iksha, it's, it's your eyes, you see things with your eyes. But you don't see Paramatma with your eyes. You see with your, your pure consciousness. It becomes revealed in the heart, not with material eyes, but with, you could say, with spiritual eyes. Then Prabhupada puts Kama, always thinking. So, thinking, it's interesting. Uh, when one, supposing you have family members, most of us have family members, some, you know, parents or sisters or family members or children. And if you think of them, um, the mind goes there and in the, in, the, in the mind there's an image. Prabhupada gives this, it's a really nice example. Sometimes, it's less common these days than I used to see it regularly, people would sometimes keep little baby shoes so when they see the little baby shoes, they see their little baby. Now the, the baby is now grown up, a young child or 
youth or whatever. But when they see the baby shoes, they see the baby, you know, the, the, the infant that was wearing those little shoes in their mind or their heart. They have those feelings towards their little child, although the little child is now no longer a little baby anymore. That's why they have their shoes. By the way, the shoes to be on their feet. Or um, he would use that example to say, when when you see um, things like a tree as a manifestation of Krishna's energy, you think of Krishna. And someone who's Krishna conscious, they see all things because all things are emanations from him in relation to the source of emanation. We discussed this two evenings ago from Prahlad's prayers. You, it's, it's, it's part of being Krishna conscious is seeing things in relation to the source of emanation. So he's saying, Kapila Dev is saying, when you go to the forest and you resume your meditation, you'll see me in your heart as I'm situated in the heart of all living entities. You'll see me situated in your heart. It's, it, it's something similar to what happened with Narada or then in turn with Vyasa. But, but Narada says in his previous life, he saw Lord Vishnu and then suddenly he disappeared. Or Vyasa, under the order of Narada, he saw Lord Vishnu in trance of meditation. And he didn't just see Vishnu, he saw the whole of the spiritual world. Pashat Purusham Purnam. He saw the Purusha in fullness. In fullness means his effulgence. In the Bhagavan feature, his associates, everything. The spiritual world. He saw the whole thing. Although it was within his mind, but it was his mind was fully concentrated on the absolute truth, on the supreme absolute truth, and he saw the, the absolute truth and fullness. So Kapila Dave is saying, you will see me. Again, Bhagavan, first person singular. So two other things, you know, and <coughs> There's a one of the many nice verses in Brahma Samhita says, I'll say it in general, one who is a devotee who's fixed in devotion and devotional love will see not just Paramatma, but will see the Shama Sundara form. That's the Bhagavan feature within the heart. No. It's the Paramatma feature that's in the heart. But the Supreme Lord reciprocates with the devotion of each devotee as he f appeared in the form of the Sringadev for Prabhad. Or he appeared in the form as Lord Ramachandra for Dasarath and etc. He appears in the form of one's devotion. If one has devotion for Shamasundar, he'll appear in the heart as Shamasundar. Premanjana Charita Bhakti Vilochanena Santak Sadaiva Ridayeshu Vilokayanti Yam Shamasundaram Achincha Guna Swarupam with in, inconceivable qualities, in, infallible, perfect spiritual qualities in his spiritual form Govindam Adi Purusham Tamahambajani so because Karda Muni is a devotee not just a meditator yogi mystic he's all those things but he's a devotee above all he's going to see the form of Kapila so it's not a contradiction 
because there's different aspects of the absolute truth and the the other aspects the Brahman and Paramatma aspects they rest or they find their pratishta their basis and support in the personal feature the very last verse of uh, the, the modes of material nature chapter chapter 14 Bhagavad Gita Krishna makes that statement um, Brahmano he pratishta aham again it's first person singular aham I am the pratishta the basis and support existential basis and support of Brahman Brahmano he, he means certainly. Certainly. I am the pratishta of Brahman. The fulgence comes from the person. And within that effulgence rests so many other things, but I am the pratishta of that which is the rest of so many things. I'm the, I am the, I'm the absolute truth, in other words. Brahman is an aspect of me and it rests upon me. That's the realization of a devotee, and the, the scriptural support for that is right within Bhagavad Gita. Very, very explicit. And last is this interesting phrase through your intellect. In your own heart, through your intellect, you will always see me the supreme self-effulgent soul dwelling within the hearts of all living entities. Thus you will achieve the state of eternal life free from all lamentation and fear. So what is that through your intellect phrase? Um, the, in the Sanskrit of the verse, it's atmana, 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 through your intellect. The, the mind, when things are in proper order, the mind guides the intelligence. When things are in disorder, the mind rules and the intelligence serves the mind. Material intelligence becomes the servant of the mind. But there's a nice verse in Bhagavad Gita where the indriyas are above prakriti, material nature. Above the indriyas or senses is the mind above the mind is the intelligence and above all is the soul of course above the soul is the supreme soul the yoga is to connect the soul with the supreme soul and then the proper alignment of intellect senses and the body the, the gross elements of the body and then connecting with the world around us the objects of the senses everything is in proper alignment when the yoga link is in order it's all in disarray when it's not. So the intelligence, this atmana that's being spoken of, this is similar to the intelligence that's found in Bhagavad Gita. Dadami buddhi yogam tam yena mam upiyantite. Krishna says, Bhagavad Gita 10, chapter 11, or chapter 10, text 11. Unto those who are constantly devoted to me, I give them the intelligence by which they can come to me. So the intelligence, when it's in proper order, it's given directly by Krishna, and it guides the mind and the activities of life in such a way we can reach Krishna. Yenamam upiyantite. That's so you can reach me. That's nice. Like, we get confused sometimes. How, do, do we... How do we make a proper choice when a circumstance confronts us? And if you're like Krishna describes in Bhagavad Gita, he'll give the intelligence. Or as Kapila Dev is describing here, I will give the intelligence. Atmana. And if we don't have that devotion, conversely, then we won't have the intelligence to guide the mind to the right place the mind will wander and it's 
chanchala, it's very flickering. Sometimes and sometimes and sometimes and it's troubling. Not steady, unsteady. Kapila Dev is beyond that because the Supreme Personality of Godhead is going to give him the intelligence to stay fixed in his mood of devotion and seeing the Supreme Lord, thinking of him always and seeing him. So, um, actually one other point, this very last part of the line, uh, the, the verse, Abhayam and Vishoka. Shoka means lamentation. Vishoka means without lamentation. So, lamentation arises when we have a desire that's not fulfilled. Say it the other way around. A sure way to become miserable is to have unrealistic expectations. If you want to be miserable, there's a guaranteed formula. Have expectations that don't match reality. And you'll feel frustrated because your expectations don't match reality. So then lamentation. Oh. The stage of connecting with the Supreme Personality of Godhead is there aren't material kind of expectations. The expectation is Krishna is very kind. And then whatever comes from Krishna is fine because Krishna is very kind. It's, it's, it's a realization of someone that has Krishna consciousness. You know, like, like Prahlad. He's not, hey, I'm a devotee. Why are you putting me through this difficulty? Not fair. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm nice. I'm a little boy, you know, why, why put me through a difficulty like this? Not fair. There's no lamentation. The, the circumstance isn't determining happiness and distress. That was the message from yesterday evening, those two masks, happiness. To, Prahlad is saying, no, oh, no thank you. I only want one thing. What's that one thing? I want the association of your devotees, your exalted devotees, who can teach the way of always remaining fixed in your devotional service, fixed at your feet, serving you favorably. So desire doesn't have to become zero. Desire has to become in connection with the Supreme. And when that's there, vishoka, no shoka. No material harsha either. No material happiness, it's not a goal of life, material happiness, let me get something and then I can be happy. And if I don't get that something or the something I get and then it goes away, shoka, be shoka. It's vaikunta, another way, no anxiety, no lamentation. And fear, bhaya, is the place of consciousness of fearlessness. And one can be, you know, a macho bully or something and, you know, no fear. It's a bluff. The reality is that this is a place where we don't know what's going to happen next. We're going to get in our car and go back to where we came from. And we don't know if we're going to get to our destination. I mean, well, good chance. But we don't know. And at some point, we're going to start our day and the day isn't going to end. I mean, the, the day won't complete. Excuse me, the other way around. That we know for sure. Death is certain. We don't know when, but we know it's for certain. So there's built into life is death. Krishna says it very plainly in Bhagavad Gita. Whatever takes birth, death is certain. Whatever dies, birth again is certain. Of course, unless one becomes free from the cycle of birth and death. There's just certain things that are fear producing. There was this uh, publicity at one point in time when Walt Disney died. 
he was extremely wealthy, one of the things that he did was he had his body frozen so that when they figured out how you could become eternal, they could thaw his body out and he could live again eternally. Far out, huh? You know, the world of fantasy, Walt Disney. Technology can do anything. Technology can't defy Janma Mrityu Jara Vyadi. Those are infallible features of this material world. And so how to go beyond fear is go into the spiritual realm. There's nothing to be gained and nothing to lose. Everything is eternal. Nice little verse. Any discussion? Hare Krishna. I have two questions. I think one of them you answered. So the Kapil Dev when he's talk uh, when he's saying the uh, he will uh, Karam Muni will realize the Paramatma feature, which is actually the Samsundra form that he will see. It's up to the Supreme Lord, but yes, he'll he'll just he'll show himself according to the devotion or the, the mood of love of the devotee. He'll show himself accordingly. So he's already, I mean, Kadamun is already pure devotee, so uh, why is, I mean, because he already realized, I mean, the Bhagavan feature he's seeing in front of him. Uh, yeah, it's discussed in this chapter. It's a natural question and it's discussed. And um, <clears throat> he's setting an example F for him it's 50-50 or six one half a dozen of the other as they say he can be with the supreme lord Kapila and see him or he can go to the forest and see him as is, is literally as he's seeing him by not going to the forest. <clears throat> so he's going to set an example. He's a pure devotee. <clears throat> and he's doing things, whatever he does, it's for service. And it's a service to set an example. No, he could do something else also. But that was the, the, what was desired by the Supreme Lord for him, and so he did. I mean, you and I probably wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> this is it. He, here he is. And it's his son. He has parental affection. He appeared as a son because that's his rasa. Oh, stay. But he's inspired <clears throat> to show by example. Second question? Do you got both of them? Okay. Anything else? Yeah? Hi, Krishna. My question is we are, uh, we know that we want to be chant and be happy. Mm. And at the same time, we are asked to introspect. And when I find myself doing that. I find there, uh, there are things that don't make me happy. This introspecting, some of the shortcomings, the blind spots, things like that. Okay. So my, so my question is just, so I don't want to work on those because I feel like they're too much, overwhelming. <laughs> Okay. So should one try to work on them as alongside chanting or just chanting with the time will take care of those things? I got the, I got the question. Well, it can work either way. And Prabhupada has at times spoken in, in both directions. 
that is to say, the, the direction that you're just do your chanting and in time they'll go away. <clears throat> the bhakti process is such that it naturally uh, cleanses the heart and removes unwanted things from the heart. So that seems to indicate just try to make your bhakti very strong and chant and be happy and the other services that follow from chanting and the unwanted things will be dissipated just by bhakti, the power of bhakti. Then there's another that says from chanting then comes a desire to serve and with the desire to serve the mood the spirit is let the master be pleased so we want to come before Krishna and Krishna is pleased but take a look at me I've got all these things that are not displeasing and they may be hidden from me and or from others but they're not hidden from Krishna is that pleasing to Krishna? Now, you can go the other side. Well, Krishna knows and Krishna is pleased, so he'll take care of the other things. Or, one can say, um, because in the front position, there's, I want to please Krishna, then there's some things I know that are not so pleasing to Krishna, so let me take that I want to please Krishna energy in spirit and enthusiasm and address these things. That, so, anartha nivritti, eradication of unwanted things, anartha nivritti, comes on the strength of bhakti. So it's, it's a different way of looking at the same thing Bhakti takes care of it, but I don't want to make Krishna a janitor. Him clean up his heart. I want to be his servant, and when he gives me the indication, there's dirty things. Let me make them clean. That's part of my service. It's a subset of wanting to please Krishna, and wanting that Krishna will be pleased. It's not, it's not separate from the bhakti process. It's part of the bhakti process. To overcome, um, to take the strength of wanting to please Krishna, strength of devotion, and in practical ways, make efforts to make the place clean. That's part of the Chaita Dharpana Marjanam <coughs> message there's something that we do rather than just something that Krishna does. And something that we do is not just chant, but desire to please Krishna, that's, that's the fruit of that chanting. And then following that desire to please Krishna, make the place clean where Krishna sits. Does that help? Yes, Maharaj. But this um, desire to please Krishna is not there or at least oh it's there you wouldn't be you wouldn't be sitting here this morning if it wasn't there you'd be doing something else it's there or or I find like the the enjoyer tendency is so strong that you don't think of Krishna okay the, that's okay that, that, uh, agreed now what you continue you continue to you ever done gardening not much. Supposing you do, you want to do some gardening, or somebody's doing some gardening, and they want uh, to plant some flowers in the spring, so that they can offer to their deities or place on their altar at home. So you get some seedlings or some seeds, and you sprout the seeds, and you get some seedlings. Then you plant the seedlings in the soil. Now what happens? along with the, what the, the flower that you want to grow, weeds appear. And weeds grow faster than the flowers. 
So while you're watering and watering and watering, and the sun and everything, the flowers are growing. The weeds are growing faster. So you have to. If you want the flowers to grow, you have to do some weeding in the garden. A lazy person can't have a nice garden. It takes some effort. Similarly, for the bhakti creeper to grow, when you chant, there's other desires in the heart besides the one, as you already mentioned. So they get nourished too. They have to do some gardening in the heart. I encourage you to read a very lengthy purport in the Chaitanya Charitamrita related to the cleansing of the Gundicha temple. Gundicha temple is before the Rathayatra in Puri. Lord Chaitanya's associates, they go to the Gundicha temple and they cleanse the temple. And long purport Bhakti Siddhanta expresses it, the cleansing of the temple is done like the cleansing of the heart to make the temple a place where Jagannatha will want to come similarly to make the heart a place where Krishna will want to show himself like it's being sh expressed here. It's the heart cleaning time. And that's part of bhakti. Now however strong, medium or weak the desire to please Krishna is the heart cleansing needs to go on. Strong, medium or weak. It needs to go on. And it's a service. Like cleansing of the Gundicha temple, it's a service. So he, he Bhakti Siddhanta speaks of the, the straws, the grains of sand and the particles of dust that, that they gathered from cleansing the temple. And this refers to this and that refers to that. And, making the heart clean. It's just, it's part of the bhakti process. Important is to make sure that the purpose is to please Krishna. Bhakti is in the foreground. And on the basis of that Krishna is to be pleased, let me make the heart clean. It's, it's a service. As much as you know, cooking for your family or chanting your japa or going to work or any of the other things that you do, those services, ultimately the services to Krishna. And this is also a service to Krishna. It's part of, it's a subtle, but it's a service to Krishna so that Krishna will be pleased. So that when you come before him, it's a big smile. That's what we want. Krishna should be pleased. So it's a, there's a service towards that objective. A mistake sounds like what you, you know, in your question you described. A mistake is to get distracted by the unwanted things and so let me not think of the unwanted things because it makes me distracted. Let me just focus on chant and be happy. The bhakti process, so both, both perspectives, the bhakti process cleanses. So just engage in the bhakti process and don't worry about it. Just engage nicely in the bhakti process. That's one way to think of it. But part of the, the, the other is, part of the bhakti process is, I want to make the heart clean so that Krishna will reside there and I'll be intimately, devotionally connected with him. So that's part of the bhakti process. It's not separate from, it's a subset of, or it's an element contained within the bhakti process. Make the heart clean. It's, it's, so it's a, it requires some effort. That's part of the bhakti process, not, in, not separately or independently. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.